I guess, brief introduction. You're probably familiar with Viv already, but she's a former professional poker player and I guess now more of a public communicator on a lot of important topics and challenges that humanity is facing. And we invited her because I think she has a very interesting and holistic approach to imagining and thinking about what the future could be. And also this aspect of trying to think and keep in mind of how can we create like win-win solutions and positive some game theory for the sort of challenges that we're facing. So maybe I'll just kick us off with asking you if there's anything you want to add to my introduction, Liv, and then I'll leave the floor open also to anyone else who has questions. No, I think you I think you covered it mostly in terms of things that are relevant for you all to know about me that you don't already. I'm doing a my main project right now is this thing called the Win Podcast, where I'm trying to speak to as many different people who I think have a unique or insightful views on how to have a healthy relationship with competition. So a lot of the topics on that center around this idea of Moloch, which I imagine you're probably all familiar with. Is everyone familiar with what when I say Moloch? That doesn't, okay, great. And what are the possible solutions to it? So that's my main area of focus. And I'm hoping that if I do enough of these interviews, that some kind of parallax of views will emerge and I'll be able to get some really top quality editors who'll go through 100 episodes and be like, you know what, there's this common theme and so on. So that's my main focus. I'm also thinking more broadly, and maybe I should have actually just done this course, frankly, because it sounds super cool, of how to build this like general movement, like the philosophy of win in terms of whether it's a hashtag or something greater, or it's like a series of getting inviting other creators who are thinking in a sort of similar synthesis mind mindset. So I've got this, that my current focus is sort of this big whiteboard with Win World and all the different possible ways I could bring that to life, whether it's through art or more like rigorous discussion or articles, et cetera. And then also like community building, because my gut says that if there's any kind of solution to Moloch, it has to be some kind of hive mind solution. There's no person on earth who has the solutions singularly in their head. At least that's what it feels like to me. If I'm wrong, great. I hope to be proven wrong, but... Yeah, so that's where my headspace is at, if that's helpful. I think that's very helpful. Maybe I'll just cheat and ask you a first question. Of, have you seen any common themes so far or like what it's like a key learning so far of doing this? So, yeah, let me think. Great question. I can't say one is jumping out so far. I've been, I've recorded 20 episodes of which five I didn't fully know quite what I was doing, so I didn't ask the right questions. However, one common theme seems to be is that it's almost like a binary switch in that some people just don't, they really struggle to embody the win mindset, feel it in the, is it like rocket or like system one, it will have a, whatever language means is meaningful to you. Some people just have that immediately. And, and it's interesting, those guests I end up having such an easy conversation with, and then others it doesn't come as naturally to them. And so it doesn't mean that there's not learning that can be happening through that episode, but it it's when I push them on these things, they struggle to have answers. So it's almost there's this, I'm starting to suspect there's this consciousness leveling up that is available to people. That's not to mean to say that people can't experience it and get there, but it, that something needs to happen in order to have people who are like willing to look at things really holistically. That said, I put a huge asterisk on that. That might just be a a symptom of just my lack of interviewing skills at this point or so on. It might not be true, but I, I wonder if there's something in that. And if so, then it would be worth like some more inquiry as to how um, we help more people see, take that perspective. Maybe it's just a case of have you done mushrooms or not in your life? I don't know. <laughs> I think some people are naturally born where they can just see things very, they're not naturally jealous people. They're not naturally, they come from a, like an abundance mindset from a, from an early age. I, I think why I'm so interested in this question more generally is because personally, I came from a very scarcity mindset growing up. I was always so competitive and very zero summy. Like I would get very jealous over all sorts of things. Anyone who I felt was a sort of a, a peer or competitor in whatever it was I was applying myself to. So whether it was poker or even in, in high school, like who was good at science, I had to be the best, you know, especially other, I would see other women as threats and in, in, to like my own status. And it was a completely arbitrary status that I decided was meaningful, but it was very much a core part of my being, this, this 
unhealthy competitiveness, which was coming from scarcity. And then it was like, uh, I can't say there was like one clear moment where I was like, whoa, I'm now online. But it, over time, it, I've just become more like more able to like approach things from an abundance mindset. But it still takes work. Whereas some people, it seems to just come really naturally too. So that's what I'm trying to figure out what it is and like how it, I can help others go through that journey and how I can help myself to not fall back into those old ways because I notice it like coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. I, and I think I recognize the feels pretty common with some, like a lot of ideas are like some people just totally into it. Others don't get it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll open up for all you guys if you want to ask anything. Yeah. Um, Justin? Just coming up some of your early commentary that maybe hive mind is one of your potential solutions for overcoming oh. Moloch. Do you, can you say a little bit more about that? What is your intuition in this direction? I think this is a really hard and interesting problem. And some version of hive mind makes sense to me, like the spread of better means that we collectively endorse is maybe one thing you can mean by that, or some of the kind of collective intelligence approach. I'm just curious if you had any idea of what, how, what a hive mind might look to you at this mm -hmm. point in time. Um, in terms of why I think hive mind is necessary is because Moloch is actually a result of a hive mind. Like it, it, Moloch doesn't happen if it's just one person, right? It, it happens as a, when you have a critical mass of people. Technically, it can happen with two, right, in the classic prisoner's dilemma. But realistically, it's what, it's a, it itself is an emergent property of a collective and so its solution presumably has to come from that same kind of space in terms of how that might look ooh, uh, i wish i had a cons uh, any kind of clear answer on that um you mentioned memes yes i think there has to be some kind of it has to be able to compete with and out compete essentially the malachian memes that are doing so well i don't suspect it can like uh, and maybe it can, maybe it doesn't need, maybe competition, maybe it doesn't need to outcompete, but I suspect. No, I think it does. So yeah, some kind of memes that are so compelling that they can essentially crowd out the Malachian ones, which you presume would spread through the internet in the same kind of way. However, the internet itself seems so primed to to spread more like negative things and anything that is like latching onto the limbic system. So would that require a sort of redesign of the internet to do that? Again, I don't know. Can we do it through existing architecture and infrastructure? Doesn't feel that way, but maybe if the meme is compelling enough and speaks to enough people and is sufficiently like holistic, then maybe it can. I don't have a strong answer on that. Something else that's coming up is that it's, it almost touches into the. So, if, if if it can in some way emulate nature, that what are the what what is it about nature that's so good? Is that like nature is is self contained? It's a closed loop. It is a dance of species collaborating, but also competing, and so on. And it creates this like seeming growth of complexity. So, if there was a way to like hive mind in the way that nature seems to have this collective intelligence that would be there, there there's probably some models that can that, that, if there's a way to emulate that model through our minds then and again we might already be doing this and we're not just like consciously aware of it like a lot of people who talk about egregores and so on think that you want to know what egregore is we're familiar with that egregore not sure it's a it, it's used in post-rationalist circles as to describe, it. honestly, an egregore is any kind of collective idea almost. That is the, uh, the Democrat egregore, the Republican egregore. I see. The Foresight Institute egregore. They all exist and yeah. some of them are preferable and some of them are less preferable. But they all, again, in theory, they're competing. It's like memes that almost an idea. They compete in meme space, egregore space. Where was I going with this? Yeah, but anyway, in terms of hi hive mindedness, I don't have a good answer to that question, frankly. But I suspect that, so I can try and paint a picture of how I see. So, when was born out of 
focus. I was making all this content about Moloch and thinking about Moloch and embodying Moloch in these videos I made, trying to like, how does it feel if it had a personality, this uh, abstract collection of game theoretic and misaligned incentives? What, how would that personality manifest? And it's very monofocused. It's very short-sighted. It's very good. At, it's pretty pretty good at getting its job done though whatever its its goal is but it's just so bad at seeing that there are other potential goals so it's a bit psychopathic etc it really hates collaboration it's jealous it's mean so i was like okay so if that's monarch what's the inverse what's the opposite and this character came to mind of it's it's, it's purple and turquoise it's like a kind of anime character that's of unclear gender and its primary thing it loves is playing it just wants to have fun and play. And it wants everyone, it just wants people to be able to keep playing more games. Whereas Moloch wants to win the, the finite game in front of it. Win-Win just wants to keep the game going so that everyone can play more. They can be like sub-zero-sum games, but it just wants to provide the space so that everyone can play and have a good time. Well, Win-Win, it, it, people often think the, op- the inverse to Moloch is Kumbaya co- collaboration. Everyone is ah, working together in perfect harmony. Win-win is a bit more than that. It's yes, it likes some of that, but it also loves a bit of shit talking and playful competitive games. And how's this tying in what I was trying to say? Um, well, well, yeah, so that comes back to this idea of like, is this hive mind meme? Is it something that competes in meme space? I think it can because it's not, win-win is not puritanical. It's very pragmatic. And when it needs to compete and get its hands dirty, it will. So I think that's one thing we should consider if we're going to be playing this meme game is we shouldn't be scared of getting our hands dirty again. As long as we've got the perspective and wisdom to realize when we're getting our hands are getting so dirty that we're starting to no longer be actually win and building something positive, essentially. So I hope that answers vaguely. Yeah, that's very helpful. If, if, have you come across uh, Tim Urban's story of us? Yes, he Tim's has, a very good uh, friend. Yeah. Yeah, oh, cool. Yeah, well, I was thinking about his giants when you were... That's an egregore. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Egregore is another word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the big giant, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Cool. Thanks so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Aaron? Hi. I wanted to ask about uh, where you think maybe the limits of win are. So I think there's some low-hanging fruits. Say we care about air pollution, but we want cheap prices. But say we would all pay... 2% more for a product means the factory has an air filter or something like that. Mm-hmm. If we could coordinate and the factories would not compete with each other. So in my world, I'm envisioning like this tool, which like holds basically a billion preferences and tries to find the win-wins. But mm-hmm. I wonder to what degree we will just find maybe like different cultures or values where say the flourishing of the lion is opposite of the flourishing of the gazelle or something like that, right? Like, where do you think is the limits of these improvements? Yeah, is, yeah, I'm not, I think, yeah, we need to be careful when we think about this idea of a radically abundant society that we're trying to build. It, it, that doesn't mean that there, there isn't, there aren't pockets of local scarcity where there are just like incompatible views those will continue to exist as far as I know. Again, there's everything should come with an asterisk because we're talking about a hive mind thing that maybe we can't conceive of it. And that even that, these like seemingly impossible dilemmas can even be solved. But sorry, so remind, your question is, what, what are the limits in terms of- Yeah, say, maybe to prompt you differently, same vision, we like take all the rate improvements, low hanging fruits, how far could that get us, right? Is it like right. like energy abundance, no more scarcity to the skies? Or will we way earlier find like conflict opposing things? Do you have an intuition here? I just finished reading Nick Bostrom's book on deep utopia, which is coming out next week. And he he's trying to give the different... Ta- I'd, be, I'd probably recommend most of you guys read this. It's, it is a hard read, I will say. There's one chapter, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but there's one chapter I think you can really just go through much faster, which is the, th- I think it's the Thursday chapter. It's, it's called Thursday on in interestingness. He goes on way too long, so I would recommend skimming that. But it, he talks about the different taxonomies, basically, of utopias. So you have technological, you have, you, yeah, you've unlocked technological abundance in the extent of there is no more 
everything is automated that needs to be automated. And then there's a deeper type of utopia, which is instrumental utopia, whereby like any goal, anything you could conceive of trying to get done can just, you, there's nothing you will ever need to strive for. You want to learn something, you can just download it immediately. You want to raise your children, you can find, you, you want to be the best parent possible, you can literally hire and create a synthetic parent who will do a much better job than you and so on. And that, he gives that, that example of parenting as an example of one where we actually might go, you know what, we want to do this because there's some intrinsic value itself in being a parent that no amount of like luxury automation or whatever can replace. And in that, he is essentially in that instrument, like mentally utopian world, he is basically implying that there would not be any trade-offs because everything, the world is so plastic you can simulate. You're like disagreeing. You're a lion and you're disagreeing with the gazelles. You can go and simulate a world where you never have to deal with the gazelles. So in theory, you're like actually just getting rid of that. Now, I don't suppose this applies to any world building for 2045, but it might be an interesting place for you guys to think through just these like real ex extreme what utopias could look like because he does do a good job of that and like really digging into what is it that we derive meaning from what is even meaning what are the different ways that we can think about how this meaning question so again i can't say i have a, a solid answer at all i need to think about it some more uh, about where what are these like where do cases where one doesn't apply but all the while we are on a planet where the, the limits are fixed in terms of physical space, like there's going to be scarcity. And presumably there are going to be some ideologies that are just by definition inverses of each other. And maybe the way around that is to create some kind of synthetic environment where they can, co they can continue to work. So even then actually even create a, some kind of win, right? Because you, let's say horrible example, but let's say Islam and Judaism, just because it's popping to mind because of all the stuff that's going on, are fundamentally incompatible. I don't think that's at all true, but let's just say these two religions hate each other so much they can't coexist. You could just create these in some kind of utopia, the winning solution is have they live in this world, they live in this world. They have ideologies get to continue to exist, but they don't ever have to have conflict because they just don't interact with each other. Yeah, it's <laughs> a great question. I, would, uh, I need to think about that some more. Great. Gina, do you want to go? Thanks. Thanks, Liv. Appreciate Hi. your uh, time with us today. And uh, I can't, I look forward to digging into the podcast. I haven't had a chance to uh, listen to it yet. So if my question is redundant, because go ahead, don't worry, don't worry. So you talk about the hive mind and I thought it was a fantastic way to think about artificial intelligence. And how do you, so do you look at it as a mullock kind of thing, or do you look at it as a threat to that human hive mind? Or is it something that you think adds to the value of a human hive mind, or is it both? And there are cases for how it couldn't add to that. Well, what specific abundance. AI do you mean? Maybe I guess it would be eventually AGI is going to... A super intelligence. Yes. I, specifically? Okay. And if there's a super, super intelligence, like what kind of thing... I think it'd be helpful to define what kind of things this super intelligence, let's say it's aligned... It's not a misaligned one, let's say, because the difficulty with superintelligence is that if we're in a world where there's like the orthogon the orthogonality thesis, if you know what that is true, do you, are you familiar with that? I don't know. Okay, it's what the orthogonality thesis basically says, and this is a very uh, bastardized version of it, but it's just that extreme intelligence doesn't necessarily correlate with like where, where it, whereby intelligence is like your capabilities to achieve a goal. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are therefore extra, supremely wise in order to know which goals to optimize for in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the, if you take this like to its like extreme conclusion, then perhaps this is how you end up with this paperclip maximizer or some like an, a super intelligence gone wrong because it's super capable of achieving this goal and so capable that it can turn the earth into paperclips and the universe into paperclips and so on. But it didn't lack that like higher perspective to realize that actually that's a stupid goal to optimize for in the first place. That would be an extreme instantiation of Moloch because it's, again, coming back to the personality of Moloch, it's monofocused. It sees its goal and it will do everything it can to win at that goal. But it can't step outside and look at it and go, wait, this seems a little silly to do. So if that's how the superintelligence plays out, then that is 
as you say, mo- that would be very Malachian. But if it's a super intelligent that it's super intelligence that is again more win winny or in that it's like wise and sees there's all these different little games out there that it could be playing and but it thinks about the overall utility under the curve and because its primary philosophy is to keep the game going as opposed to just win a particular game, then it might choose which ones to play and and that type of super intelligence is that's what I'm hoping with I'm still very skeptical about whether we can do this or we should be doing this. Um, but if it were possible to build something like that, which by the way is getting like close to God, essentially, then that would be great. And that would help significantly. And then if we can find a way to, um, if, if it sees fit that humans are part of that win winny thing, and actually it likes humans having a hive mind that we can interact with and so on, then I could see a very beautiful future through that. That would be the type of utopia, I think, if I was trying to paint and design one, it would be something that... Um, is a blend between, again, nature and technology, humans and robots, the like masculine urge to go out and explore and conquer and the feminine urge to stay and, and nurture and build connection. Like it's a synthesis of all of these different dimensions. So I, that's a way that AI, if it's done right and, presume, and uh, assuming that it's possible for such an emergent wisdom to actually come out of uh, a silicon substrate, which again, I don't know. One day, like some days I think that it's absolutely not possible and only nature can create something so super intelligent and wise. And other days I'm like, am I just being a substratist? Maybe silicon is capable of this too. And it's actually a, a, a true, like these effective accelerationists would argue that this, I think a lot of their beliefs lie in the, the emergence and beauty can come out of silicon-based processing. Again, not uh, unclear, but... Yeah, so it's just a huge depends basically with AI. But if I was world painting a world where AI is good, then that's the kind of vibe it would need to have. And I do like this this like thinking of the difference between intelligence and capabilities and wisdom through this lens of like games and like intelligence is knowing how to win the given game. Wisdom is knowing which games to play in the first place. That's the kind of world I'd build. Thank you so much. Yeah, I look. Uh- really like the that wisdom point as well any other questions from the group oh justin yeah i'm happy to go again when i was thinking about the hide mind i was thinking about other strategies that might help overcome moloch and i can imagine bottom up and, and top down potential processes and i'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about for example something like a, a widespread spiritual awakening of some sort on behaving better. It's like a bottom up approach where the, all the individual agents incentives change or their outlook change in kind of a quick, fast paced way. And you get, you overcome some of these things, or you can imagine some type of institution that are able to overcome the uh, kind of limitations of short sightedness and mm-hmm. limitation of yeah, competition and zero sum thinking. And we maybe we'd sleep some of this on the international stage uh, to some degree with education, clearly, where there's lots of violence. Do I have any in, intuitions around like other ways outside of the high mind? Maybe some of these, it really can help more is moral awakenings. Uh, we seem to have some of that over time, both at specific times in history, but also the strong argument that our moral reasoning is is better now. We have some progress in that direction. Definitely. And so you can imagine some top down and bottom up forces. I was just curious what your thoughts are. Yeah. No, I I very much agree. Again, I would imagine a solution needs to be a synthesis of both top down and bottom up. I think it feels that a lot of the crypto community and the adjacent communities who are like decentralization is the only, they almost now, whether maybe maybe I'm straw manning them by assuming that they mean perfectly decentralized, where everyone is completely equal, and that, but that seems again all intuition here. I'm not an expert in decentralized networks. I wish I was. You should get Vitalik on for that. But that seems insufficient. Like you do need some top-down centralizing forces. Now, whether that's an actual like power structure or whether it's as you say, like a kind of more centralization in terms of, or, or like a more like closer alignment in terms of people's preferences. Maybe that can be the sort of the, the balancing counterforce of centralization. 
I don't know, like one of the things, again, Nick mentions in his in his book is, and actually is a solution to like the vulnerable world hypothesis more specifically. Uh, if you guys have read that, if you haven't read it, you should absolutely read it. It's just a really important paper. Is like one way we can make it less likely for people, if we're in a world of ubiquitous, dangerous technology, is just to make people more aligned in the way they think and make it so that the idea of being a mass killer is just abhorrent to everybody. It is. It's like 99.9% abhorrent, but that's not enough. So that could be the centralizing force that we're actually looking for here. It might. It doesn't have to be a like institution in the way we like conventionally think of an institution. It could be a meme. It could be that everyone takes ayahuasca and that aligns people. I don't know. There's plenty of like, risks that can come with that, but... Do it might help. Huh? It might help all the same. Look, my, I was in, in agreement with you. It might help some, some uh, psilocybin or some hawaska might. Some, uh, yeah. Just, oh. It's certainly that I know, but like truly, I think it's a thing that it's now I'm glad that psychedelics are becoming more mainstream to discuss, but I see them as a form of technology. And I think they're a very valid form of technology that seems to, they come from, like I'm increasingly, I was extremely skeptical that of like when people say, oh, the mushroom spoke to me. And it's, I, I was very like, I was like, yeah, sure. Like something in your mind spoke to you and you felt like you attributed to the mushroom. I'm now truly on the fence of actually, I think there might be some kind of another form of intelligence that we are actually tapping into. But again, whatever your epistemic status on that stuff, I think either way, there, there's true validity and almost, I suspect, necessity. Maybe it's like a critical mass of society has experienced these like altered states through psychedelics. It doesn't have to be everyone, but maybe that's sufficient to create this leveling up, but getting people to shift internally to like more in states. Psychedelics were a huge part of like up le leveling myself up. I, I, we would be remiss to dismiss that and only look for like classically te technological solutions because, or to exclude them from the technology stack, essentially. So again, I'm sorry, I always forget the question. <laughs> Remind me what you Yeah, what are other... Yeah, yeah, I do think there is... One thing we haven't particularly touched on, though, is like there, like some of these zero knowledge proofs and like trustless protocols and such that are being developed in in decentralized networks through crypto and so on. I think there's huge potential in there, and that it's a very big part of the technology stack. Again, I suspect I'm not an expert. I'm like it's more again like a vibe check thing. If you're not familiar with Vitalik Buterin's writing on it, I would recommend it. He's one of the best thinkers on this. Excellent, thank yeah. you. Yeah, more. Yeah. Awesome. First, thanks so much for joining. And there's so many different things I guess I don't want to bounce on. Like one on the Vitalik thing, I think he wrote the DEC post that, that is interesting uh, in, in that regard. Um, and it's also interesting when you talked about the different kind of like memes earlier, like yay, EAC, now we have DEAC, then we have BCI acceleration, then we have all kinds of other accelerations. So like I feel like there's definitely this kind of like meme like evolution of memes happening right now very fast. I'm considering okay. trying to, I'm considering putting, you know, how they've got E slash ACK and everyone's got E, whatever. I want to do win slash win as my equivalent no, of pronouns. Is it, this is great. Yeah. Yeah. If he goes off for it, like, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm just sense, sense checking it on different people, whether it's, I don't, I don't know, again, like maybe I'm being too puritanical, but I feel like Ugh, it's an icky game, but maybe that's the way. But at least there's one way to find out is just to play it a bit. But if it, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you said this about, I guess, psychedelic, because first when you said we can just maybe have people more be more aligned almost on a neuroscience level, I was like, ooh, that seems like 1984 in a really drastically like mind crimey way of mm -hmm. making people very aligned with the with the with one ideology. Um, but I think psychedelics, the great thing about that is it's not just like necessarily aligning you to one thing, but it's often lowering your priors. And so it's actually also preserving a lot of exploratory space. And which I think otherwise I would be worried about if you're aligning to one thing, you may just like wire your head to this one thing, but you don't really have the kind of novelty and diversity that often brings progress. But I think right. the psychedelic world is a good one because it preserves that. That was really wonderful to hear. I want to just ask one thing about that. Of, do you think meditation to some extent can uh, be, I guess, like a possibly like less risky version of that or something, even like probably a less, I guess, like less radically effective one? And then I have another question on, I guess, the multipolar, vulnerable, whatever stuff afterwards. But yeah, mm -hmm. just first. On the meditation thing, I wouldn't say I'm best qualified to answer that because I am not someone who has managed to have a regular meditation practice. 
from what I gather of people who are regular practitioners, it's so valuable that, that, that it may be sufficient. For me, I can't say it has been sufficient because I, for whatever reason, haven't been able to develop a, a sufficient practice of it. For me, the best route was through psychedelics. I think it, it deeply personal question. <clears throat> Maybe if you're concerned, then try the meditation route first. Uh, and yeah, it, it seems a lot of people like say it's a, as good or even better in many ways, but I personally haven't experienced that as much. Meditation on psychedelics, now we're talking. But <laughs> for me, it needs a bit more. Yeah, I, it, it could be as simple because I think, again, so much less, so much of this leveling up is through like love of nature and seeing the value in nature and like tapping into feeling like this kind of interplay and like different type of intelligence that is playing out there is a huge part of it. So maybe it's sufficient to just be in nature, go hug a tree, whatever speaks to you, basically. But it's for me, the psychedelics is just it gets me it it. it allows me to settle that like scarcity part that sees things as competitive. And in my evolution through it, I went through a phase of being then scared of that side and being like, oh, mm -hmm. now I've learned to love it again. Now I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, I haven't completely squashed it and it will come up and I just find it funny when it comes up and like sometimes useful. It's, but I had to go through this period of being like, oh God, what am I? This, am I I've got something bad in me. Um, but yeah, thinking about it was a combination of psychedelics and meditation. But yeah, the, I, I need, because I'm not, self-discipline is one of my uh, weaker parts. So the, the psychedelics helped with that. Yeah, I agree. I saw you recently treat on the, you know, animal, basically just like the way that we produce current meat. Right. And like the, just the, the horror of that. And I think that sometimes a problem with psychedelic experiences is that it shows you this entirely different thing. Then you're back in the real world and it's like, how do you even bridge that delta? <laughs> like, how do you inside? Right. Make how do, how do we integrate? That? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that is difficult, I think, to see that. And I guess like meditation, at least is something that you can do daily. You can like integrate it into your practice or something. I, I think like something like a scaling out of these solutions or scaling them up would be like really helpful, especially because they show you a world that is so unlike the one that you then banged over the head with day to day that it's sometimes really hard to make progress in, in this delta way. And I, I wonder if... Yeah, if there's a good way to bridge that chasm, but maybe not. Yeah, I did do this course recently, which was like one of these sort of emotional intelligence courses. There's one in Vegas called Choice Center. The one in Austin is called Ascension Leadership Academy. It sounds a little culty and that it's like, uh, you, end, you come away from it and you end up recommending that everyone does it. But it was actually very valuable because it like gives you, and funny enough, its core ethos was win. I didn't even know it. The guy was just like, we don't win unless everyone wins. It's all about, and it's not lose when, like, you shouldn't give so much to yourself, of yourself, that just to help lift up others that you then suffer. Like, the best things are when you win and they win. I was like, all right, this is a good sign. That's been pretty helpful. Like, I've noticed my own self-discipline has improved significantly since I did that about a month, six weeks ago now. So there are other paths, is my point. Like, these... I doubt that many of you in this group are like lacking in self-discipline in the way I am, just by the fact that you were like joined, you chose to join this course. But it, 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 uh, yeah, I found that pretty helpful. Okay, awesome, thanks. I have one more question, but I also know Jose's hand was up for a long time. So go for it. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you for that. So I guess we already touched a bit upon this uh, when talking about preference aggregation and all that. But I wanted to ask what your views are on like what the role is of imperfections within utopia. And what I'm thinking specifically here is if you read Brave New World or if you read uh, Return from the Stars by Lem, you have societies where uh, basically you have through chemical means or whatever, but you have manipulation of the limbic system of people so that everyone is constantly at a positive state, right? At a positive mm -hmm. uh, hedonic state or however you want to put that. So technically, there's very little suffering in those worlds. Everyone is having a good time for the most part, but the authors really want to put it in a way that you feel like we've lost something fundamentally. Right. You're, it, it, it's shallow. It's, uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. So in, in doing whatever, in eliminating aggressiveness in people, in drawing people all, all the time and whatever they're doing, we've lost something fundamentally human. And that utopia, that apparent utopia is not really that. And, and it's all because there's not enough suffering or not the right kind of suffering or challenges in those worlds. So where are you, what are your thoughts on that? Mm. 
it's it there's yeah i don't have a firm opinion in either direction i will say one thing that like again nick points out in his book because it tried it touches on this exact question was like when we're thinking through utopia it should we need to do our best to not think about how it looks to us from us as from this perspective what it looks like to be one of those people and more about what is it like being in that and having like how is it experientially and and how it would play out over time because I agree, our, because our intuitions are like based upon people evolving from this. Now, does that mean maybe when you're living in that world, like you just those intuitions literally no longer serve the same way we like there's plenty of intuitions, which now we should we wish we could get rid of. Right. And so it's try and come at it from that lens as best possible. Because it's the hard thing. I guess what I would try to. Mm, yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember exactly. So this is funny enough. This is the top when I mentioned it's like the hardest chapter in the book that Nick wrote. It is the one dealing with this exact question. Um, and I like the nature of interestingness. Is, is this thing actually interesting that we think we're missing out on? That all those people would be missing out on? And so I'm trying to see if I can summarize it. I don't think I can. Maybe you do just have to read it all. Uh, yeah, I, I think really it's just try and as possible put aside your lens of what is it like to, how does it, your lens of seeing it from what we know and try and be in that world. And are you actually really missing anything? Now, I will say I haven't read Brave New World or that other book you mentioned, so I'm limited on my answer. I'm not probably able to grok just as much as they, as, but I can probably see what you're getting at. But yeah, I don't have a good answer, unfortunately. Awesome. Thanks. No worries. Anyone else with a question? I feel like that arguing the mic. So if anyone else has another one, feel free to go for it. Otherwise, I'll... <laughs> I'm going to. I didn't answer your second question, did I, Alison? Oh, I never asked it. I, I this first one to oh. have uh, mostly a jump in uh, if you want to. So feel free to interrupt me, basically, by just raising your hand. But the other bit uh, was basically going back to what you said on, on vulnerable. What about the decentralized versus centralized merits or benefits, and on some of the zero knowledge cryptography stuff? Because when I read vulnerable world hypothesis, which I guess to bring up to speed is basically okay, the world is really vulnerable. We have bio risk, we have AI risk, and so forth. Over time, they will just pro pro proliferate. More and more people will be able to have access to them, and and we have the small kills all risk by which like a smaller number of people will be able to destroy the world, and eventually it's just not sustainable. So instead, we may have to consider solutions that sound terrible right now, including like a total global surveillance yeah, that's yeah. that's also like total enforcement and so forth. And I always thought that's one way that we could make somewhat of a leeway into this problem of like total decentralization and proliferation. But another one is, is this third way of using cryptographic technologies of using like multipolar settings by which different kind of like entities watch each other in privacy preserving ways. They, and I think there, there's a lot to learn like from the crypto sector because they have been like building these more decentralized kind of accountability and right checks and balance systems for so long. So I'm Really curious if you have any more ideas on this kind of like third way to not have total decentralization, not have like centralization worries, but have this third way of like like mutual checks and balances built in this multipolar way. And maybe you don't, but that would be really interesting. Yeah, no, I'm just yes, literally I'm... because I just, <laughs> sorry, it's, it's funny we're having this conversation. So I just interviewed Nick yesterday for the podcast on Utopia and Vulnerable World Hypothesis. And I'm just running up my notes of what I wanted to ask him because I had some of this written there. So yeah, as you mentioned, like one of the solutions he proposes is like multi-stakeholder surveillance things where basically you, it doesn't work unless you've got X number of independent people like saying, like checking on it and going, yeah, okay, you can go ahead um, uh, continuously. Similarly, like multi-stakeholder government models, maybe slightly more off topic from that, but this idea of differential tech. So De 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 developing, putting more effort into defense-based technologies first, and then the riskier, more dual-use ones get like comparatively less funding. And is there a way, like the, the dream would be to find ways to align market incentives that like actually incentivize defensive tech, because right now the market, it, it's, it's just not very sexy to the market because it's like you're basically building something for a just-in-case and it's, that's what markets are not good at particularly. Once it comes along, great, but it's now too late. Yeah, what else? Yeah, I can't. I, I, so I asked him this question on is, is there like a, what are his thoughts on the third attractor that sort of could emerge from that? And he 
didn't really have an answer. And I can't say I have a particularly good answer on it either. Aside of, again, like, how, so it's, it would be like a multi-pronged approach, again, like aligning people's in, 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 intrinsic values more and then also having some kind of decentralized s- surveillance, essentially. You need that as well. But no, I don't have much. Sorry. Yeah, it's just not really built yet. And it's, I think, cryptographic solutions are always costly, like costlier than doing it a different way. And so it's, yeah. it's hard. But there was one interesting paper on AI uh, and able, sorry, on regulatory, on, on decentralized regulatory markets for AI. And so it was people at GovAI basically took an approach from mm-hmm. Jillian Hatfield, which is basically like, you don't just have one nation state or one global UN or something monitoring all AI development, but instead you have these regulatory markets. Um, where it's, it's much more like decentralized kind of market uh, mechanism that monitors AI development. And the way that it does that is through this like privacy preserving layer by which different labs, for example, can just say, can through zero knowledge proofs or other checks can just say, yes, I'm like adhering to the evals mentioned here. And there's these privacy preserving proofs. And then other labs can check that the other ones are uh, actually abiding by the pre-agreed right. protocol. And I thought that was neat. But again, it's a paper. It's not really something that we know how to do at all yet, but I thought they were really interesting um, ideas there. Uh, okay, awesome. Um, cool that interview, Mick. And I have more questions, but I also want to leave more space for others. Does anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, maybe I'll ask a question if no one else does, which is just since this this course is about imagining a positive scenario for 2045, I should also say that there's no AGI in this world. Um, oh, there, okay. Yeah, there, there's advanced narrow AI, but not AGI. It's because it's an interesting um, constraint in that you can't just say, oh, AGI came and right. solved. We this. just have God and God tells us what yeah. to do. They tend exactly. or something. Yeah, like you can't. We found God. And yeah. <laughs> but I would be interested if there are any like just key things that if you were thinking, like if you were doing this practice, would you like any particular technology or like a certain value, I guess the win value or something like that, that you would want to make sure is included in your world if you did this? Yeah. I, I'm fine. I'm just right, working on a thing right now, which is the 10 principles of win. It's like a tongue in cheek, 10 commandments. I haven't published it yet and I haven't really told anyone about it yet. Any other first, first people. But the two, I could summarize them quickly. Uh, maybe that is helpful. Let me. Yeah, this is like very like an exclusive. But yeah, I don't, I don't want to set your expectations too high. Um, <laughs> where is it? Oh, it's on my substance. Let me guess again. Ten principles of win-win. All right. Number one, the universe is fundamentally and radically abundant. Scarcity is the exception, not the rule. As such, a mindset based in scarcity will ultimately self-defeat. Number two, permanence is a fool's errand. A living universe is increasingly complex and dynamic. Be adaptive, not boring. Three, do your best to grow the pie, not just take from it. In the rare case where the pie cannot grow further, only take your fair share. How you define fair is up to you. Four, and this is where I was getting at with this next quote, is one of the core things, if I had to distill this down to two things. Love is that which enables enables choice. As such, true power comes from empowering others to make their own choices, to design and play their own games. Five, all games have consequences. Intelligence is knowing how to win a game. Wisdom is knowing which games to play in the first place. Six, selflessness and sacrifice are not as noble as they appear. For such acts, a lose-win. The best acts are mutually beneficial. Seven, a win game requires some collaboration. That said, games can, and preferably should, contain competitive win-lose sub-games within them. Number eight, uh, scoring systems can be useful tools, but resist the temptation of turning them into primary goals. In other words, don't be a dogmatic maximalist. So that's basically Gotthard's law. Nine, while trade-offs can exist, beware of false dichotomies. A paradox often dissolves when viewed from higher dimensions. Number 10, don't take anything too seriously. The universe loves to play. H- how does that sound to you guys, by the way? Is it like... No words. Yeah. You're really? going to be nice to be on a Zoom call. If, 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 truly, if any of you have some feedback, feel free to message it privately. And if it's, it's totally fine, if it's, this is too douchey of a thing to do, I'm, it's unclear whether it is or not. Because um, it basically sounds like I'm creating a new religion, which I don't know how I feel about that. But, <laughs> uh, but what I, I guess, what this, if I had to boil that lot down into two key things, it's, and neither of these are my ideas by any stretch of the imagination, 
The first one is love is that which enables choice. So it's, that's like the anti talking about like third attractor. That's like protecting against the tyranny, mass, horrible centralized control against that negative attractor away from the tyranny. And then there is the best games. Winning truly means keeping the game going, not just winning the short term game. In other words, it's like coming from James Cass's Infinite Games, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Those are the two things. If you can combine choice maximization with the infinite game, I feel like that's where the good stuff comes from. Um, that's where I'm operating from. Again, that came from a psychedelic trip. So I <laughs> love it. And I think that also ties in, especially like keeping games open infinitely, that ties in a lot with, I guess, just evolutionary game theory, <laughs> like the things like tit for tat, for example, emerging on top, at least under specific constraints. And especially if you don't know when a game ends, you're more likely to be to play cooperatively than if you know that the next turn is definitely ending. ending. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so that's a really good that point. Message. Yeah. Have you heard of open source game theory at all? No. It's from Andrew Critch and it's about basically like part of it is related to a causal trade, basically like trading with entities that are a causally related to you in time and space. Uh, and basically if you can come up with specific game theoretic cooperative like scenarios or even architectures that make that more likely before knowing the mind states of the entities that you're playing with mm -hmm. or when and where you'll be playing with them. Basically, for example, aliens that may or may not already exist or something like the Rokos Basilis or an AI that may or may not already exist. And there's some really interesting writing on that. And he's trying to get a possibly like universal things to put in place. One of them, which is like boundaries, like basically don't infiltrate each other's boundaries so that people can like opt into the games that you play with them. And I think there was a notion in your principles also that was related to it. Yeah, they're really I'll take they're beautiful, very succinct and great. I don't know if anyone else has any comments, questions on them. That was a lot to process. Yeah, I, yeah I'm sorry. I've rattled it through. I'm going to post it fairly soon, but yeah, I don't want to make you guys be my editor. <laughs> I think maybe we have time for one final short question if someone wants to grab the opportunity. Justin. Sure. Nobody else wants it. So one of the pushbacks, I, I think you get this pushback about Moloch is that it, it, re it like reduces individual agency and it's, it can be determinative in some ways. I'd just love to hear your succinct response. Well, what do you mean by which part of Moloch reduces individual agency? That, that Conditions of the game are such that uh, we can expect some of the yeah. outcomes and the individual right. behavior. And so it almost yeah. absolves yeah. people of their responsibility because they're like, Look, it's not my fault, it's the game. Yeah, no, you're, that is one of the vulnerabilities of that style of framing of the, na yeah, of the problem. And yeah, I've always tried in my, any of my messaging about it to be like the rules of, yes, it's true that it's in large part, the, the fault here is the rules of the game suck. But that doesn't absolve anyone of their individual responsibility. It, if everyone didn't behave selfishly, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have that, that this issue wouldn't arise for the most part. There are some instances where it's like basically unavoidable, but like a lot of this is, again, if everyone was perfectly enlightened, we wouldn't be having these issues. I'm fairly confident of it. So it's very, I think it's very important and I need to like, make sure that I'm probably doing an even clearer job of that in any messaging I do around it, that it's like, hey, this is not getting off scot-free. And again, the solution to it is both thinking about, it's again, top-down design change and bottom-up uh, mindset change. And that's what I've been trying to use, like this, like the messaging of the Moloch mindset. Oh, you're behaving Molochy, like giving people the tools to point out, no, you're being a defector, essentially. Don't be a defector. And I think there is value I don't like shaming as a term, but in, in being responsible, pointing out to others when they're being like that way and also being responsible for yourself. And again, this is not like novel stuff. This is everyone's been, the, the notion of personal responsibility has obviously always been a thing throughout history. So, but yes, I agree. It, you have to be careful not to, because what, what would be terrible is if, and we're already seeing this, is like AI CEOs going, what can I do? We're in a race. And then like washing their hands of it. And so it needs to be handled delicately around that and point out, oh, you're just, you're being an agent of Moloch right now. Like it, it, pointing out that there is agency in this and you still always have a choice. That's great. I think you do a good job with it. I just thought it was a nice. No, it's a really point. important point. To, th thank you. It, it's, it's very important to get across and, and arguably probably more important than the actual, I don't know. It, my desire to talk about the Moloch stuff came out of seeing all these angry kids being like, wow, they're feeling so 
they're so frustrated and trying to like find a single person who's at fault. And it's like, this is not sufficient. Like this, be mad at the game itself. Um, direct your energy to thinking about how to fix that. Um, but that, because it feels like there's plenty of like personal finger pointing going on, but maybe it's, there's definitely value in keeping some of that as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Liv. I think there's like, uh, a lot of useful learning. I hope so. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have more like, concise answers to a lot of this stuff but that's the nature of the situation but yeah it's really great to meet you all super excited to see what worlds you will build yeah yeah so we're all excited to see it when like when does this course officially end or when is the yeah soon actually april 10 we'll have a our winners announced and then we should try to get up on the website pretty i'm very curious to see both the artwork and just like all the details of the questions and everything so hopefully Hopefully they'll right. be up in a few weeks. I look forward to yeah, seeing it and I'll, I'll try and publicize it if that's helpful. Um, that would be amazing. Yeah. Of course. Oh, great. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Nice everyone. Best of luck. Bye. Bye.